Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. Would you turn your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 1? We've been in our evangelism series and I want to talk about one of the greatest tools you have and how you can use your testimony to evangelize today. Your testimony is a testimony of what Christ has done in your life, and it can change lives around you. And we're going to be in 1 Timothy because Paul shares his story really, really briefly, what Christ has done for him. And I just want you to know, like, you don't have to have that story where you were shot at nine times and lived to tell about it. <laughs> there are people who have been through dramatic experiences. I just watched one this past week where a gentleman was shot at nine times and had been a drug addict for 18 years and none of the bullets hit him. And he heard a voice from God say, serve me instead of drugs, instead of this life. And he gave his life to God and has been serving him since as a minister. Praise the Lord for those stories. Yes. But if we're real, that's not all of our stories, is it? And, you know, for me, I was raised in the church. I've seen God work through the church, through his people. I've seen uh, Jesus change my life, my attitude, my heart towards people, or even towards him, uh, towards holiness. I, I want to be holy. All these things have changed in my life. I've watched Jesus change lives in front of me as I've evangelized and shared the gospel. So I have a story to tell, too, that says God is real and he is faithful, and so do you. So don't count yourself out. If you didn't have that dramatic story, uh, every one of us needed Jesus the same amount. We all need Jesus. And we're going to look at 1 Timothy 1, verse 12. And in this little moment, Paul expresses his gratitude for what Christ has done for him. He does this in Galatians 1 as well. But we're going to look at this one particularly today. Verse 12 says, I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength to do his work. He considered me trustworthy and appointed me to serve him. Even though I used to blaspheme the name of Christ, in my insolence, I persecuted his people. But God had mercy on me because I did it in ignorance and unbelief. Can anyone else say thank you, Lord? that in my unbelief and ignorance, you came and rescued me. Amen. Verse 14, oh, how generous and gracious our Lord was. He filled me with the faith and love that come from Christ Jesus. If you're lacking faith, if you're lacking love, you're lacking Jesus. Let Jesus fill you today. Let him fill you. He will give you what you need. Verse 15, this is a trustworthy saying. You know what he's saying here in the Greek? He's saying, you can trust me. You can, you can trust me without reserve. Don't hold back. Trust me. This is so true. You have to hear me out and trust me. This, he's pleading with them. And everyone should accept it. Okay? He's saying this. This is a trustworthy saying, and everyone should accept it. And the saying is this. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And I am the worst of them all. But God had mercy on me so that Christ Jesus could use me as a prime example. So he, if he's the chief sinner, he's now the chief example, so to say, of his great patience. So Christ Jesus is using Paul as a prime example of his great patience with even the worst sinners. Then others will realize that they too can believe in him and receive eternal life. See, people are going to watch your life. People are watching the life of Paul, and they're going to go, wow, if, if Paul can be changed, then I can too. And then he goes into a praise song at the end, all honor and glory to God forever and ever. And he says something really, really interesting here. He is the eternal king, the unseen one who never dies. He alone is God. Amen. Amen. I want to start on the end there real quick. Paul admits that you don't see God. But what he's trying to say is you can see God 
by my changed life. Now, they saw Jesus and they testify of the life of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus. But today, we're removed from that moment in the first century where Jesus walked on earth. But lives have been marked and changed by Jesus. We make God visible too because our lives have been changed visibly in people's eyes. We can make God uh, be seen through our own testimonies. And so I praise God for that. We're going to look at four things that we, I see, and there's probably many things you could see in the scripture, four things about Paul's story. And, and number one is Paul's humility about his past. He was humble enough and, and confident enough of what Christ had done for him that he was willing to talk about his past again. Now, for those of you who are newer to the faith and haven't read all the scripture or the Bible yet, I want, you, I want to give you a quick paraphrase, but I would highly encourage you to read Acts chapter 9 to, to see his conversion, his story. But Paul was uh, in charge of pretty much persecuting and putting Christians in prison. And uh, he is on his, on his way to Damascus, and God shows up, Jesus Christ shows up, and, and practically blinds him and speaks to him and says, why are you persecuting me? Because when you persecute the church, you actually persecute Christ, because we are one with Christ. And why are you persecuting me? And then Jesus changes him, because he's, he's like, I'm going to use you now to be a messenger to the Gentiles. So in other words, you're no longer going to persecute me. In fact, you're going to serve me. And it changed Paul's heart. And his companions there didn't see the light that came from Christ or see Jesus, but they heard a loud noise and they heard, a, they heard the speaking going on, but they didn't know what it was. And so Paul goes to the next town and he runs into Ananias, who God gave a vision about Paul that he was going to be coming and he has changed. Now, I don't know about you, but if someone has the reputation of persecuting and sentencing Christians to death, you'd be a little nervous about meeting this guy. So God makes sure he takes care of that, uh, shows up to Ananias in a vision. He meets him. Uh, they find out, he finds out that he has changed. He has changed for sure. And what, I'm just giving you a paraphrasing of this, but you know what Paul does immediately? Paul begins to tell and reason with people in the synagogue in that city about what Jesus has done for him. And he was doing so well sharing his testimony and the facts of Christ and what Jesus did in the Old Testament and what he did there in that moment, how he showed up, that no one could refute him. He was, he was winning the arguments. So here's a man days before who was on his way to Damascus to persecute Christians, and now he is defending Christ. And people are in awe. Right? Well, they're so threatened by his ability, they are trying to kill him. They get him, they sneak him out of the city, and he escapes to Arabia, where we see in Galatians 1, he spent about three years there. So a lot of people think that right away Paul began ministry, but there's actually a time span uh, between Acts 9, 22, and 26, where Paul left to go to Arabia for three years to get training and to grow in the Lord. And then he comes back to Jerusalem to meet with the apostles. And uh, there, Barnabas and, uh, verify that he has changed. Um, so is uh, Jesus' brother, James. And so they, they pretty much encourage him to go and minister. And then we know Paul as one of the greatest apostles and missionaries in the world who have written, who, he's written 13 books of the New Testament under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Isn't that an awesome story? So that's one of those big dramatic stories too, right? But Jesus has changed you as well. And what I love about what Paul was like in this scripture is he was humble enough to admit what he used to be like. Number two, Paul's gratitude for God's generous mercy. Paul sees how bad he was, but he's so grateful for how merciful God is. Have you been captured by God's generous mercy recently? Even today in our service, you know, just taking communion, singing these songs of Jesus laying down his life, being captured by his generous mercy, being grateful and expressing it. But one of the greatest ways to express 
your gratitude isn't just through song, it isn't just through prayer, it's by the way you live, telling people about his mercy. Paul couldn't help but talk about how merciful God is. He was always saying it. He was always praising God. Number three, we see that Paul's conviction for the gospel of Christ comes out. Paul's, Paul's passion and conviction that the gospel of Christ be known, that he's ta- talking about his story, but he has to make sure he talks about the gospel. What's the gospel part? When he says, Jesus came to save sinners, which I am the worst of them all. Jesus did that for all of us, and Paul couldn't help but make sure people know. He's talking to Timothy, his under-shepherd, his understudy. Timothy's a pastor in Ephesus. He's writing this letter to him, and he still wants to declare the gospel to someone who already knows the gospel. But why? He's under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit writing this letter, and, he, and God was going to use this letter to preach to the nations around the world. God has saved lives through this letter as well. Paul is always talking about the goodness of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ because he's so grateful. What's the gospel again? That he saved sinners. No, I love this, this quote from William McDonald, this portion from his uh, Believer's Bible commentary. This is what he says, and just hear this out closely. It's not on the screen, so hear me out. Here we come to the very heart of the difference between true true Christianity and all other teachings. False religions tell man that there is something he can do or be in order to win favor with God. That's what false teaching says, that you can do something or be something, and when you do, then God's going to love you. The gospel tells man that he is a sinner, that he is lost, and that he cannot save himself. And the only way he can get to heaven is through the substitutionary work of the Lord Jesus on the cross. It's the only way. The false teachers pushing their salvation through works and law will push this on man. And man wants to hear this. We tend to want to hear that we can do something somehow to contribute to our salvation or to, we can do something to be right for God but that's not the case. The gospel insists that all the glory for the work of salvation must go to Christ alone. That man does nothing but the sinning and that the Lord Jesus does all the saving. That's a powerful statement. That is the gospel. And Paul recognized that he did nothing to be saved. I've recognized, recognized that in my life. I recognize that I couldn't have died on the cross and paid for my sins. I can't do enough good things to be forgiven. I can't pay my way in. I can't know enough. The gospel is that Jesus did it for you while you were still sinners. One of the things I hear all the time when I talk to unbelievers in our community is they think they have to get themselves cleaned up before they come to Christ. No, we come to Christ and then he cleans us up. That's the gospel, we couldn't do it, yes. We have to come to this moment, and it might happen for you today, where God's going to convict you, convince you, encourage you to trust in him today. If you're in this place today or online and you don't know Jesus, stop striving to be just right for God. If you're not a believer yet, if you haven't trusted in Christ and what he's done for you, trust in what he's done for you, and then now you'll have the power and ability to live that life you're supposed to live. You can't save yourself. Only Jesus can save you. And we trust in his work. You don't get credit for it because it's a gift from God. I think sometimes we want credit for something we've accomplished, right? We're those kind of people. We don't get to accomplish our salvation. We won't get the credit. God gets all the glory. And that brings me to the last point. Paul's purpose in this scripture was the point everyone to Christ, not himself. Paul's purpose was to point everyone to Christ. And I love that Paul knew his purpose. Beforehand, it was to arrest Christians and get everyone to practice Judaism. He thought that this new way of Jesus was going to stamp out Judaism. They were a threat. That's why he persecuted them. When he said that he blasphemed Jesus, he was insulting Jesus and he was insulting his followers. That's what it meant to blaspheme 
him. He admitted he was doing all those things. Now he knows that God has entrusted in him the task to tell everyone about the wonderful grace of God. He knows his purpose. You know how amazing it is to know your purpose in life? Well, I just want you to know that some of you, your purpose is to be a parent, to be a great father, great mother, great kid, right? To be a, a, a fantastic servant in our community with the job that you do, to be a, uh, to be a coach, a teacher, those may be your purposes, but in the kingdom of God, one of your purposes is to tell the world about the wonderful grace of God. It needs to be on like your top three list. And I'll get into that here in a second. But I want to highlight something I noticed this weekend um, in preparing for this message. I want you to see how Paul's not ashamed to talk about his past. He's actually open and transparent about it. You know why? He knows he's been truly forgiven. He can let go of that shame. Maybe you've been ridden with guilt. You know, you're just, you're full of guilt and shame and you feel like, you know, your life BC before Christ is still, you know, there and you haven't been forgiven. You're not, you're not washed clean. That's not true. You are. And, and in fact, don't be ashamed. Now, we don't wear our, our past sin as a badge. Like, yeah, I used to do this, this, and this. <laughs> You know, we're not like that. But don't be ashamed, okay? Don't be afraid to be transparent about your story. Here's why. There are people who are walking through the same struggle that you used to walk through, and they need to hear how God got you through it, through Jesus Christ. Paul, Paul was talking about that. I am being used by God to display the wonderful grace that he has shown me. And here I am, the worst of sinners, in my opinion, he's saying. And so now everyone could see that they too can be saved. Some of us have done so many bad things in our past, in our community. There's people in our community who have done such egregious things and sinful things. They feel like they can never be forgiven. And maybe you have shared that journey as well in your past. Don't be afraid to share that in your story. But obviously, it's not about you. It's about pointing glory to God, amen? And I'll finish that point with this. Paul's focus wasn't on what he did for God, but what God did for him, amen? Now, 2 Corinthians 5, 15 shows us how Paul knew his purpose in life. And I wanna hit hard on this a little bit. I hope you're ready to receive some loving correction in how we're living, okay? 2 Corinthians 5.15, he died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. Does that hurt a little bit to read that? I think it does in, in American society. We live a lot for our own pleasure and self, don't we? If we're real and honest, we tend to do everything we can for the comforts and the pleasures of ourselves. And it has also been a struggle for us believers and the thing is, we're supposed to be set apart, different from the world, not better, but different, okay, not better than, but different, and pastor always says better off because we have Christ, but knowing that we want others to experience it. We're supposed to be different, but too often the world lives for themselves and now the church starts to look like the world. We've been saved not to serve ourselves, but to serve God. And Paul says that there, and it says in the next part, instead they will live for Christ who died and was raised for them. Um, we sang it earlier that we lay down our lives because he laid down his for us. I want to encourage you, church, to make it a point that your purpose in life is to live for Christ and not for yourself. Acts 20, 24, to just continue that. This is what Paul says. I'm, I'm sharing this with you because this is near the end of his life before he was killed for being a Christian, for, being a, for uh, preaching the gospel. He knew that he was gonna suffer and be persecuted. And he said this, but my life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for finishing the work assigned me by the Lord Jesus. The work of telling others the good news about the wonderful grace of God. Wow. 
If we could just get an ounce of that devotion, you know, that dedication to God, that I don't have purpose in this life. If, it's, if, if I'm not doing what God wants me to do, if I'm not doing, you know, sharing about the wonderful grace of God that a lot of people don't know about, if I'm not doing that, then I don't have a life full of purpose and I want to change that. And I know that you're not Apostle Paul or Peter or John or Jesus. I'm not either. We have missionaries that were resembling them. They're totally devoted and dedicated, have laid down their lives. I've read stories where the missionaries have packed coffins because they're not returning home and they bring their coffin with them, okay? They know they're gonna die for Christ in that new land to preach the gospel. I realize that that's not necessarily our case, that we do have children, we have jobs in the, in the public community and arena. We have a life here. But don't you think as Christians, we need to have a devotion that's close or that's working towards doing everything to make sure everyone knows about the goodness of God? Don't you think we can make a little alterations and reorient our lives a little bit, that we spend a little bit more time and then a little bit more time and a little bit more time moving things out of the way and doing what God wants us to do? Don't you think that that's something we can do as the church of Jesus Christ? That was a really long run on sentence, wasn't it? Question. You get it. Yes. And I preach this with my own life, looking in the mirror, going, God, okay, let's say I'm a teacher. Let's say I'm a coach. Let's say I'm an IT consultant. God, before I go to work today, I just want to let you know, I live to serve you today. And I don't have purpose in life if I'm not telling people about the wonderful grace of God in my office today. Can't that be a heart that we have? I believe so. Amen. Well, buckle up because I got to be real quick to finish our message out. All right, because now I want to get super practical. This was the beautiful story of Paul. He gave his life, okay, and he shared his story of what Jesus did for him. He shared the gospel more than anything. What do we do? How and when do we share our testimony? Well, we use an acronym around here called BLESS, B-L-E-S-S, and it's a tool to help us. And I'm going to have it on the screen for you. Sorry, I'm jumping around. For, uh, those of you who are here, okay, thank you. Tech in the back, they're great, following me around. Um, the BLESS acronym is something we use, but we never got to the share your story when I was teaching this. And so the first thing is we begin with prayer. Okay, you're working on someone, you're loving someone, you're praying for those who are lost. And oh, let me preface the rest of this message with this. We're gonna be like in Bible training class, okay? And here's the reason why I'm seeing that churches aren't teaching and training on how to share your faith or share your testimony. So I wanna make sure that we're equipped because according to Ephesians 4.11, it's my job as a pastor and leader of the church to equip the saints for the work of ministry. And I wanna be faithful to that. So we're going to do a little classroom training on how to share your testimony, okay? But before we get to you sharing your story, a lot of times we have to bless people. Do you have someone you're blessing? Do you have someone you're praying for, you're listening to their life and their story, you're eating together and listening to their story too? As Christians, we like to eat, right? And then we serve them as you're, as you're praying for them and as you're listening to them at work or in your neighborhood, Okay, you're, you're eating with them, you're hearing things on how you can serve, but you can also invite them to serve with you at some church event or outreach so they can see the church of Jesus Christ isn't the way the narrative is being out there. We're not perfect, but man, are we being like, I mean, we are just being smeared online and in the world as we're this terrible group of people. It's not true. And sometimes your friends and neighbors and coworkers need to come see what we're doing for, for people in our community. It's amazing. All right. And then what you've done is you've been praying for them. You've been eating with them. You've been loving on them. You've been patient, working, helping them to, with life, all these things. You've even been patient and gracious when they've said things they shouldn't say or have different views than you. And now you're like, it's time for me to share my story. Um, I say this today, I train this and teach this from my own examples. 
And even what my wife and I are going through right now, we're at a place where it's time to share our story with a neighbor. So this is like training for us, okay? And so let me give you five things to consider here real quick. Number one, we're gonna talk about share, okay? And there's no reason to be shy about sharing about Jesus Christ who means the world to you, okay? What is it gonna be? Is it, is it the fear of rejection that's gonna stop us? Is it the fear of turning someone off? Well, let me give you a what if question. What if it's the opposite? What if the person you've been loving on and caring for, they've been dying for you to say something about Jesus? And what if you say, can I share my story with you? They go, yes, I've been, I've been wanting to know why you keep sending me cakes and brownies and why you keep praying for me, loving on me, serving me. Yeah, please tell me already. We have found that a lot of people were dying for you to say something because they're nervous to ask too. That's the reality. That's from the ground. That's from experience what I have seen. But even if we're rejected, at least you obeyed God. Even if you turn them off, at least you obeyed the Lord. So number one, share. Share why your relationship with Jesus means so much to you. And by the way, these notes are online, calvarydover.org forward slash grow. Even share an explanation of who Jesus is and what he's done for humanity to be saved. I think it's important for you to write down a paragraph or, or two of your story and how Jesus has changed your life but I've, I've used this strategy and really it's just care and love. I've used this everywhere I go when I share my faith. And I, I go, hey, do you mind if I just, we've been talking for a while, we, you know, hey, you've been cutting my hair or you've been serving me coffee. Can I share with you for a moment, you know, why I've been that way in front of you or why when you ask me, what am I reading? I tell you it's the Bible. Do you mind if I share with you what Jesus has done for my life? Simple as that, I ask that question, okay? If they don't got time, it's okay. And then when I'm done sharing my story, I always ask about their story. And what do they think of my story of Jesus? So I don't wanna just be the one that talks the whole time. I wanna ask, tell me your story. And they may never mention Jesus, religion, nothing. That's okay. I just wanna hear what's going on in their life so I know that I can listen. That's the next one. So share, ask, and listen. I want to listen to them. I want to listen and discern for areas that need further dialogue. There are times where people have questions. People have hurts from other, other Christians or churches. People have fallen for lies from the enemy, the devil, on things about God and church. And I have to always kind of fix those things before I even share how to be saved. So you take time to share your story quickly and you share about what Jesus has done for all of us. You ask them for their story and usually this setting is where there's time, all right? And then you listen for cues, for things that you can pray about or connect Christ to. And then fourth, invite. A lot of times, People just need to be invited to believe in Jesus Christ, to confess him as their Lord and Savior. And many have taken this approach um, in case someone uh, walks away and they're not ready to at that moment, or we're, we're concerned that maybe they'll pass away or you know, something tragic happens in their life. Many people, even if they don't have success to pray with that person right there, I have learned from my dad and others, and I've practiced this myself, to share how to be saved before they leave you, just in case. And so I wanna to give to you the ABC's process of salvation that I have used, that some of the God uses. It's basic, it's simple. It's, it's supposed to come from the heart, it's not supposed to be a formula, okay? But it's A stands for admit, admit that I'm a sinner. The B stands for believe, believe Jesus paid with his life for my salvation. And C is confess, confess Jesus as my Lord and Savior. So if they're ready in that moment 
I would say, do you, do you want to pray with me? And will you be willing to admit that you are a sinner? Would you be willing to believe that Jesus has paid with his life for your salvation? Would you confess out loud when we pray that Jesus is your Lord, your leader, your master, and your savior? Would you do that today? When they're ready or if the Holy Spirit's ready to work, it's going to happen. If not, at least they learn the ABCs. Amen? And so we do that. And by the way, that's online with scriptures. Pastor Kuhn talked about it a couple weeks ago. All that's online. Either way, the last one is pray. Whether they want to pray for salvation or maybe you can just pray for anything in their life, try to leave that conversation by praying for them. Because the enemy's working too. Okay? But also pray that the Holy Spirit works on their hearts when they depart from you. Okay, now, if they pray that prayer, you should celebrate right there on that moment. Now, today, in this room, in closing, you may not have realized that Jesus did this all for you. And in fact, during this service, perhaps God has been convicting you that you need him. A healthy, good conviction a realization that I am a sinner and I am doomed. I am helpless without Jesus. So I'm preaching this message, right, about training all of you to go preach the gospel and to share your testimony and lead people to the Lord. But there could be people in this room today that have never had an encounter with Jesus. And so we want to pray together. Amen? Would you, would you saints, would you pray with me? Let's, let's close our eyes and, and bow our head. There's nothing more important right now than this. And next week, I want to encourage you to invite friends and coworkers and neighbors. Just be bold. Invite them to come with you. Because I have one more message for this series. And I'm going to make a plea to the unbeliever of their need for Jesus. Sometimes you just got to do that. Let me pray for a moment. God, would you work in hearts today? Push back the enemy. May your Holy Spirit just flood those who need you. Call them to you, God. May they see Christ. May they see what he's done on the cross. May they believe today and confess you as their Lord and Savior. God, show their desperate need for you, God. And they're in good company. We've all been there. We've all seen our need. Lord, I pray you would do that. With every head bowed, eyes closed, if you're ready to admit that you need Jesus today, would you raise a hand right now? Because we're going to pray with you. Amen. I see hands up. Amen. Wow. There's a lot of hands going up. Praise God. Praise God. Wow. Praise you, Lord. Thank you. Let's pray this. Dear God, and you can repeat after me, dear God, I admit I'm a sinner. I can't save myself, but you have saved me. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for forgiving me. I believe in Jesus and the salvation that he has won for me. And I confess Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I will follow you and give me your Holy Spirit to live for you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Can we give God glory and praise? Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, guys.